evening, and it's a wonderful opportunity to welcome Eileen Markey here, as well as all of you who have come to hear her. Um, Eileen grew up learning about church women featured in her book, A Radical Faith, The Assassination of Sister Mara, and their example inspired her to devote her career to covering issues and neighborhoods overlooked in the more glittering popular images of New York City. She trained under executive, investigative journalist Wayne Barrett at the Village Voice, and from him learned to love archives and documents. She spent five years studying Mara Clark's life, reading her letters, spending months in the Mary No Mission archives and following Mara through four countries, interviewing scores of her friends and co-workers, people she lived with and people she worked with to assemble this portrait, perhaps including some of you or some of your friends. In addition to authoring this book, Markey is an independent journalist specializing in urban public policy and religious cultural issues. Her work has appeared in a variety of places, including the New York Times, City Limits, the New York Daily News, New York Magazine, The Village Voice, Wall Street Journal, etc., etc. Her journalism work is focused on the ways in which sometimes arcane government policy impacts life on the streets and sidewalks of the city, and she has an extensive knowledge of New York City public policy and how it affects the poor and marginalized of the city. Critical journalism that is more and more necessary in our world today. She is a graduate of Fordham University's Urban Studies program and Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism and currently lives in the Bronx with her husband and two children. Her husband's here tonight. We are delighted to have her here with us and we welcome all of you. We'll listen to her and she'll give us ample opportunity to ask questions. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you for, to the Center for Human Rights and International Justice um, and to the Center for the Church in the 21st Century for co-sponsoring uh, and for making this gathering possible. It's wonderful to be here at another Jesuit institution. I'm a Fordham woman. Um, and to be here in Boston, and I kind of suspect among some people who knew Maura, um, who worked, uh, Maura worked with the Diocese of Boston's Commission on Justice and Peace in 1977 and 1978, um, and lived with Sisters of St. Joseph um, in, a, in a St. Helena's house, um, and so has friends throughout this area as she has throughout much of the world. Um, her work in Nicaragua and in El Salvador was about human rights, so it's fitting to be here at a center devoted to human rights. Um, I suspect the story of the church women of El Salvador, Maura Clark, Ida Ford, Dorothy Cazell, Jean Donovan, is a familiar one uh, for many of you. It's a story I was raised with growing up in Catholic schools in the 1980s and as the daughter of parents who were part of Pax Christi. Like many others, I grew up learning about the church women as modern martyrs, as exemplars of committed Christianity, as women who took seriously the gospel admonition to love your neighbor as yourself. The church women martyrs were a shock, but they were also a clarion call to many US Catholics in their days, and their lives continue to inspire and to goad many of us. But for people who may be unfamiliar with the church women, a brief background. On December 2nd, 1980, four US women, three of them Catholic nuns, were killed by the military government of El Salvador, a Cold War ally. The four women were stopped at a checkpoint set specifically for them outside of San Salvador. They were taken to a military base and tortured, then killed, their bodies discarded by the roadside and discovered the next morning by peasants in the area. Their murders were an international incident, setting off years of debate on US policy in Central America. Surely we were backing the wrong side of the Salvadoran Civil War if we were arming own killers and the government that assassinated Archbishop Romero, the argument went. Their deaths led to a series of US and Salvadoran investigations drove thousands of US Catholics and others into opposition to US intervention in El Salvador and Nicaragua, and prompted a long and winding legal campaign that culminated just two years ago, just in the past two years, 
in the deportation of, the, of two erstwhile US allies, two Salvadoran generals, who had been the head of the National Guard and the Minister of Defense at the time of the murders, and who had been living comfortably in the US since the late, late 1980s. So there was this long and complicated human rights law campaign to get them um, tried, uh, held culpable for this and many other murders, and then eventually deported. Um, and so they are back in El Salvador, those, those two men. So let me read a little bit from the beginning of the book, and then I'll explore the life that preceded this famous death and suggest how this story might be relevant for us today in the context of human rights, in the context of solidarity, in the context of resisting tyranny in the current moment. How is the volume and speed? <laughs> the grave was fresh. The soil yielded easily to the shovels. It was no trouble, really, to uncover the bodies. They were piled one on top of another, buried quickly the day before, under orders from the local military commander. In minutes, they were hoisted from the narrow ground and laid beside each other in the cow pasture. Their clothes were askew and their faces dirty, their hair mad with blood. Two of the women appeared to have been raped. A tigulote tree, its limbs reaching over the place where they lay, cast a little shade. The women had been missing a long day and a half. Now they were found. An onlooker stumbled to the ground, fell on her knees. A veteran nun who'd been working in El Salvador for four years, Maddie Dorsey had seen dozens of bodies like these. Bloodied, discarded, floating in a lake, or tossed helter-skelter on the roadside, they were often left in places where people could easily discover them. The bodies became a message of fear and warning to all who saw. See what happened to her? This is what troublemakers get. More than 8,000 people were killed in such a way in El Salvador in 1980 alone, the first year of a 12-year civil war that left over 75,000 people dead. The killings weren't random. They were carried out by the country's army, by the National Guard, by the National Police, by squads of citizens organized and trained by those military entities, and by groups of off-duty military men operating in clandestine brigades named for Maximiliano Hernandez Martinez, the right-wing dictator of their father's generation. The people killed were members of farm worker unions and cooperatives, students, nurses and doctors who gave public health trainings to poor people, teachers, people involved with their parish youth groups, catechism instructors, Bible study group members, indeed anyone who questioned the economic and political system in El Salvador. As central as the church women's story is to a certain class of Catholic and to people concerned with US Cold War policy in Central America, we only ever knew them as dead. It's as though they were born in that grave. Understanding them this way relegates them to the role of victim, people on whom something was acted upon. They are silent in the grave. An indictment, surely, but inert. Helpless, maybe even hapless, victims. In the years since their murder, the women have been shorn of context. Their killing and their lives remembered as somehow separate from the political reality of which they were a part. Their death somehow different than those of the other 8,000 Salvadorans who were murdered in the same way in that one year. I began this book because I wanted to understand who Moral Clark was the oldest, the most experienced missionary, the one who spent the longest time in the pre-Vatican II church, I wanted to know who she was before she was cut down. <clears throat> so allow me a little bit of that. Who was this woman in the dirt? What forces in her life, in herself, led her to this vicious death so far from home. What did this ring, slipped on the slender finger of a 22-year-old 
have to do with farm laborers and death squads, clandestine meetings, and military orders. Um, her body was partly identified because uh, a local authority, a local justice of the peace, uh, went to the site where these women's bodies were found um, and, and removed the ring from one of them uh, as help in identifying her, as, as, as you might do with a Jane Doe, uh, to have a ring. And so then, uh, a day and a half later, when her uh, friends and colleagues came looking for her, they went to the, the nearest local authority, this Justice of the Peace Office, who said, well, they were four North American women. Um, these are kind of their descriptions. One of them was wearing this ring, and of course it was her Mary Noel ring, the, the ring that the sisters wear. Um, and the, the ring that Mary Noel wears is a chiro, it's the first two letters of the Greek word for Christ, and there's a, you know, it's like the P with the X, and, uh, and a circle around it representing the world, so it's an evocation of the crucifixion um, and, and being part of the whole world, uh, which every Mary Noel wears from her first vows. Uh, so this was the identifying item. Um, so what did that ring mean? How did kneeling and taking your vows as a 22-year-old in 1953 lead to this death thousands of miles away in a totally different geopolitical climate, uh, in a totally different way of understanding what church was? So who was this woman in the dirt? A few answers. She was kind, she was gentle, she was unbelievably sweet. Sometimes her friends thought she was gullible. She was deep, she was grounded, she was profound. She was actually no one's fool, but she was secure enough, open enough uh, to be guileless. She had a preternatural ability to connect to people. Um, Everyone I interviewed, honestly, everyone I interviewed who knew her personally said that when Maura spoke to you, you felt like you were the only person in the room. Uh, this is from fellow sisters who were in her same entering class, uh, sisters she worked with as an organizer in the 70s, uh, people who came to parish, uh, consciousness raising sessions she ran, market women, ex-guerrillas, people she rescued, human rights attorneys. When Maura spoke to you, there was no one else. Uh, it was this unbelievable personal ability and something she had as a kid, long before she was a nun, long before she was politicized. Uh, this is how her high school friends talked about her. When Maura spoke to you, you mattered. You felt as though you mattered. <coughs> That's a really radical idea, actually. And I think even more so in our own day when we're all so bifurcated and distracted and barely present. Um, this notion that this, this young woman and then this middle-aged woman was, was able to pay attention to the soul in front of her, regardless of who they were. Um, and was, you know, almost compelled to find the person who was left out. And as a kid, that meant, you know, the person who was on the outs at the party, the person who wasn't having a good time at the dance. Um, when she was living in this women's community, um, uh, the, the home for single working women in Boston, it meant finding people who were not the easiest to hang out with. Um, you know, people with personality disorders or people who are hard to spend time with and sitting next to them instead of the person it might be a little easier to be with. Um, it meant as a teacher in a, in a gold mining town in Nicaragua, finding finding a way to care for and pay attention to and regard the kids she worked with and their mothers and their fathers. So she was sweet and she was present and she was, um, you know, other regarding. She was also a threat. She was religious, of course, but she was political. She was part of a broad social movement for political and economic change, active in El Salvador, but also in Nicaragua and in the United States. She had long before chosen solidarity over charity. She was no good doer, no do-gooder, right? No bumbling, let me just collect some shoes, do-gooder. 
She was bolstered by a deep inner life, habits of compassion and humility, a willingness to learn how her role was part of a whole, even when learning that was uncomfortable. And she was formed by a radical, dangerous belief that everyone mattered. So in approaching how to write a biography of a woman who's been gone for 30, 34 years when I began, or 33 years when I began, um, whose life spanned 50 years in a few different countries, I tried to organize my questions. One of them was, how does a nice girl like you get to a place like this? <laughs> Mora was born in 1931, the oldest child of immigrants in New York City. She grew up during the Depression and World War II, part of a wave of Irish becoming Americans in a parochial, anti-communist church that argued being a good American and a good Catholic could be intertwined. She walked under the words for God, for country, carved into limestone as she entered her elementary school at St. Francis de Sales in Bell Harbor, Queens, New York. She entered the Marianal Convent in 1950, one of a flood of young women attracted to the adventure and steely glamour of the Marianal sisters. Becoming a Marianal sister wasn't about locking oneself away or hiding from the world. It meant bravery and daring, establishing a life in an exotic country, driving jeeps across swollen rivers, administering vaccines to diseased people, disease-ravaged people, teaching children in bamboo schoolhouses and riding mules into the jungle, facing adversity in the service of God and fellow human. It was an order for roll-up-your-sleeves can-do girls. Mora's first overseas mission in 1959 was to Siuna, Nicaragua, a gold mining town where the children were malnourished and the gold miners died of lung diseases, even as the multinational mining operation enriched itself with plain loads of gold each week. In the beginning, Mora and the other sisters, though scandalized by the poverty, kept to their tasks. They were there to run the school and clinic, to bring people closer to God, to offer an example of holiness. But while Mora was in Siuna, a few things happened. The Second Vatican Council meeting in Rome and the thinking that emerged out of it reordered the role of nuns. No longer were they to be pious adornments, sanctifying the world by virtue of their virtue. They were instead to be yeast in the dough of the laity, expanding, bubbling up within the church, that is, bubbling up within the people of God, to form a kingdom of God that, that Jesus described. Some nuns I've talked to describe this as when we went from the good sisters to the damn nuns. <laughs> in 1964, the Marianal Mission in Siuna began using an adult faith formation curriculum called Familia de Deus, Family of God. It was inspired by Paolo Fieri methods of popular education, and it dramatically reordered the relationship between teacher and student. So, you know, they were there, Mora was a teacher, and she was a teacher and eventually principal of this mission school, and then they also ran a clinic. Um, but responding to the universal call to holiness, the lay people needed to be educated as adults in their faith, they started doing this adult faith formation work and using this curriculum. And because it was 1964 and it was written by Marinol and, uh, and by actually a diocesan priest in Chicago, it, it used Palo Fieri methodology, because these are the kind of currents that were moving through the church in that really exciting opening moment, right? This, this opening the windows moment. Um, so when you read that curriculum today, it seems tame, but what it, what it did then was absolutely revolutionary because it, in Siona, it took the nuns out of the classroom where they were, you know, my father describes in this era, thinking that nuns were like some third gender, like not, not part of humanity, right? Uh, like some, he wasn't quite sure that they were people. Um, and so the, the sisters in Siuna were that. They lined up at the door as the barefoot children walked into the school and they, they taught them with love and kindness, but there was a really strict hierarchy of authority. Um, and so when the sisters started using, under Mora's direction as local superior, 
this adult ed curriculum, it meant the sisters sat in the houses of the parents of the school kids. They sat in the class, they sat in the, the family's little houses, which were often just built with cast off, um, like the remains of soap crates and uh, canvas tarps. And people didn't have furniture, they might only have a, uh, a hammock that the, that the family slept in, a series of hammocks. The mothers cooked over a couple of stones outside. Um, and you know, the sisters knew that intellectually, but sitting in that house as an equal in that circle with a couple of women, or eventually a couple of couples, was a really dramatic reordering of power, right? So they were no longer the teacher imparting knowledge to the kid, but the facilitator, listener, um, co-creator of something in this learning interchange. Um, so this familiar, so familia de Deus methodology, it reordered this relationship between student and teacher. Um, it meant that Moore's role was to draw out understanding, not as an authority figure with the answers. To ask a circle of illiterate peasant women, were they their brother's keeper? Where was God? What did these stories of fishermen and an itinerant preacher mean? This was revelatory. Mora moved from the white U.S. missionary with the answers, here to instruct Nicaraguans on how to be better Catholics, to the role of sister, a partner, a fellow member of the people of God, striving to build a society worthy of God's children. Surely children of God, the family of God, shouldn't be dying of lung diseases and mental poisoning in order to enrich foreigners. Surely the children of God shouldn't be beaten by the National Guard or tortured by the dictator's special squads when they had the temerity to ask for higher wages. So a tiny bit about that. And none of this happened overnight, right? It happened as these new understandings, as frankly reading the gospel more often, and then uh, new understandings of how to interpret it uh, were shared between sisters taking, you know, enrichment classes and going, uh, going to study with Jesuits for new new ways of doing theology and pastoral methods. Um, some of you are familiar with the documents of Medellin, which came about four years after this period that I'm talking about. But when I was doing this research, you know, I was I was really keen to understand when did she read the documents of Medellin? When did that happen? Um, these are the kind of the foundational documents of liberation theology, which emerged in 1968 when the bishops of Latin America met for their conference, kind of a following on from Vatican II. Each region was supposed to have their own conferences to figure out how to apply all these new ideas. And they met in Medellin, Colombia, and came up with these unbelievably radical and transformative documents that are kind of breathtaking to read today, um, written by bishops. Anyway. In doing this research, I realized, well, of course, Medellin didn't like spring from the head of Zeus, right? Like somebody was thinking those ideas before they got to the bishops and before the bishops wrote them down. Um, so a huge part of that was a changed concept of church, right? From church as this institution and church as a thing you needed to fit yourself into in order to follow the strictures, in order to follow the rules, to church as the people of God. Um, like the idea of teachers asking their kids questions, seemingly really obvious to us today, um, but revelatory at that moment. The church has this Pauline notion of the people of God together. The concept of church as the family of God meant that people had a responsibility to care for their neighbors. It also meant they had rights. They were God's beloved family. God wanted good things for them, not suffering. Mora found the ferment the connections formed between previously suspicious neighbors inspiring. The people in the Pueblos are beginning to unite and to make their voices heard. Siuna has been abandoned for so long, but there's an awakening of hope, she wrote to her sister after several of these Family of God workshops were up and running. When Mora set out for Nicaragua in 1959, she thought she was going to bring Christianity to the people of Siuna. It was the mindset of the era. But living in Siuna, she learned, of course, that God was already there. What the sisters had to do, she realized, was listen to the people they were serving, to understand how the world worked from their perspective at the bottom. 
The shift meant casting off the role of savior or authority with all the answers. Instead of working for poor people, more would be working with poor people. It was, in effect, an act of changing sides. As she embraced her new role, Mora saw more and more keenly the injustices that the people were subject to, the effects of low wages at the mine, the arrests for failing to kowtow to the National Guard, the alcoholism and family violence that sprang from hopelessness. If this was the body of Christ, it was being tortured. Mora's response to tyranny once she was able to look at tyranny, was solidarity. She was becoming Nicaraguan, taking the side of the people getting their teeth kicked in, walking step by step away from the exceptionalism and the comfortable innocence of being an American. By the end of the 60s, the Marinol mission left Siuna to embrace new work in the slums of Managua. They freaked out their bishop. Here, Moro would be essentially a community organizer, establishing groups of faithful into cells to study and pray and work together as new base Christian communities. This really fecund, really post Vatican II Latin American movement that, you know, here you were going on Curcio retreats and forming groupings that met once a week. It's the same kind of idea. Um, it was the idea of making the parish parishes in Latin America were huge. They were geographically really huge. There was always a shortage of priests. Um, so the pastoral movement for the base Christian communities initially was, well, let's just get a smaller group of people together that you can actually relate to and make the church not just something you go to for baptisms and funerals, but something that's part of your daily life. Um, so they started these base Christian communities in the slums of Managua in, in 1970, Mora moved there to start doing that work. The work was pastoral, it was about bringing people into closer relationship with church and with God, but it was unavoidably political. To gather poor people together, to analyze their current society against the standard promised by Christ is political. And as the members of these new base Christian communities moved from prayer meetings to marching for the release of political prisoners and demanding the fair distribution of the fruits of the earth or the fair distribution of the millions in international relief that poured into Nicaragua after the 1972 earthquake, the Somoza dictatorship recognized these new groups of Christians talking and praying and marching for the grave threat that they were. This was opposition to Caesar. The majority of Nicaraguans suffered tyranny and Mora stood beside them, threw in her lot with people she had grown to love. Opposing tyranny, this is important, out of deep and sober belief in love. In the mid-1970s, Mora and fellow Marianal sisters lived in a displaced persons encampment outside of Managua. It was called Open Trace and it was miserable. It's a Spanish acronym meaning uh, permanent emergency, national permanent emergency, operation number three. This was the third such location uh, where people were evacuated to after environmental and other disasters. But it was called Open, open Three, Open Trace. A collection of cast off people, shaken from their rural homes by drought and insecure land rights, moved from the squatter settlement in downtown Managua by a rising lake and by the earthquake. They were sent to this desiccated former cotton plantation. You can imagine the agricultural value of former cotton fields. It's like dead, it's totally used up soil. It was a dusty, sun-baked sprawl of tarps and cardboard. Mora and the other sisters continued their subversive work, telling poor people they mattered. The base Christian communities in Open Trace became part of a resistance to the Somoza regime, overlapping with and in common cause with the emerging Sandinista movement. This is what Mora did during her last years in Nicaragua. Organize citizens to demand a bus route, march for a fair price for water, sit in dialogue masses with Fernando Cardinal while the private school kids who would become the leaders of the revolution 
and the street kids of Open Trace hashed out what it meant to love one's neighbor, to lay down one's life for one's friend. It was religious, and it was political. She came back to the U.S. to engage in what Marianne called reverse mission. These weren't fundraising appeals after mass, uh, with appeals about colorful natives. This was radicalizing middle-class American Catholics by helping them understand what their tax dollars paid for, what their allies engaged in, and how their brothers and sisters lived and died. And then, in 19, 1980, Moore accepted the call of Archbishop Oscar Romero, who wanted more Marianal sisters to work in El Salvador. I think a lot of people are familiar with the letter that Archbishop Romero, now Blessed Romero, wrote, I think in February of 1980, uh, asking Jimmy Carter to stop sending fun funding to the Salvadoran government. Um, he said that all funding to the Salvadoran government is military funding. Any funding of this regime will be used to kill us far from advancing the cause of human rights. It will destroy it. Um, there was a letter he wrote just about a month before he was killed. In that same time period, he also wrote to the leaders of the Marianal Sisters saying, we need more Marianal Sisters in El Salvador. Um, he particularly, and this is a great thing to comprehend, he particularly admired the Marianal Sisters for their closeness to poor people, the, the kind of level of keeping it real. Um, which is what uh, one of his assistants, Monsignor Orioste, said when I spoke to him. Romero admired the Marinal sisters. Um, so, in 1980, he asked for more, and she responded to that call. Um, if Mora's politicization and shift in work had been a gradual evolution in Nicaragua, in El Salvador, she was stepping into a fully formed nightmare. The country was in tumult, in tumult. A movement for social, political, and economic rights were met there not with petulant tweets, but with a vicious and concerted campaign of state terrorism. So what did Mora do in El Salvador? What were those nuns doing down there? If one of my early questions in this research was how does a nice girl like you get to a place like this? And, when did the nuns go from the good sisters to the damn nuns? The last question is, what were those nuns doing down there? Um, and, and that's a question that people who were skeptical of the church women certainly asked with a, with a cut behind it, right? What were they doing to get themselves killed? What were they doing wrong down there? Um, but I realized in kind of the ways that we talk about them, we kind of gloss over that. Well, they were working with the poor, same as Romero, right? So they were working with the poor. Well, what does that mean, like when you get up on Monday morning? And what does that mean on Tuesday afternoon? And how do they occupy their days? Mora was only in El Salvador for a brief four months, but what did it mean to be working with the poor, actually, day in and day out, right? So Romero was assassinated before Mora arrived, but a few years earlier, he had set up a human rights law office called Socorro Verico, uh, a legal aid arm of the archdiocese which initially pressed some legal cases to try to um, ameliorate the lives of individual poor Salvadorans. Um, but by the time, by the last year of Romero's life, um, and then it continued after he was killed, by the time Mora was there, what it did was it documented human rights abuses. So when you hear about Romero's amazing homilies that were treated as like a, a newscast for the country, right? everyone would tune in to hear those homilies, um, because you would find out what happened. It wasn't, I mean, there was, there was great pastoral care and theology in those homilies, but there was also an accounting of last week six people were killed here and 12 people were killed there and this mouse grave was found and da 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 da. All those statistics, all those individual stories that he told in his homilies were collected by human rights documenters working for Socorro Oredico, his legal aid office. So he was killed, but that work continued and Mora and Ita especially, worked for the Socorro Juridico, for this legal aid office, collecting specifics about human rights abuses. Um, and so that meant going to the site of, of where some horrifying thing had happened and getting the name of the victim and their age and whether they belonged to the student union or the farm workers council. Um, 
finding out who their parents were and which division of the military had committed this crime and writing down the dates and the names and the times and the spaces, right? Um, Mora and Ita were among 15, among the top 15 most active people doing this sort of human rights documenting work in the country during that very vicious fall. Um, the person who ran that legal aid office, his name was Beto Coyar. By 1981, he had to flee because there were so many death threats against him. Um, he again said, oh, those women were brave. Which, you know, you and I can say those women were brave. Beto Curiar, as the head lawyer for Romero, could no longer live with his family because his presence put his family in such danger. But the, the death squad came to his family's house anyway, and they came carrying three coffins, empty coffins, for him, for his wife, and a small one for his child. And he thought the church women were very, very brave. Right? He continued his work after that threat and after many more threats. Um, but he thought the church women were working a kind of singular capacity in the country because of the region of the country where they were working, and because they stood out, and because they were very much known to the authorities as those North American nuns who keep traveling up and down the length of the country. They worked in the northern region. They came in with these human rights reports to San Salvador to file them with this legal aid office. Um, and when they would be in San Salvador, they would also speak to reporters, um, which also mattered, right, that they were explaining the things that they were seeing to outside press. Um, so documenting human rights abuses was a huge part of their work. Another component of their work was doing relief, working for another agency of the archdiocese, bringing food and clothing and banned medicine, medical equipment, to people who were on the run because their families or their children were dissidents or guerrillas or because they were suspected of being such. Um, so they, they brought these 50 pound, they stored these 50 pound sacks of rice and beans and cooking oil in the little, um, the little room they lived in kind of at the back of the church in Chalatenango where they worked. Um, and to give you a sense of the like kind of black humor, they knew it was really, really dangerous work, right? Like the archbishop had been assassinated while saying mass before they arrived. So they were under no illusions about how dangerous this, this mission was. Um, but you also can't live in, constant, in a constant state of terror. Um, so there was one night when a friend was visiting another Mary Eleanor was visiting, and they smelled gas they, outside their house. And so they went outside thinking someone had, had doused gasoline around their house and was going to set it on fire because that was like a reasonable <coughs> thing to think might happen. And they went outside, and, and that's not what had happened. It was just like a leaky car. So they came back in and pointed to the, the big sacks of rice and beans that they stored up in the rafters at this you know, makeshift kind of place where they lived. And said, ah, that's where we're going to die. And the rice is going to fall on us in our sleep. That's what's going to get us. <laughs> but so they delivered this food and clothing to people who needed it. And a lot of these people were people on the run because, um, because the Salvadoran military was engaged in this counterinsurgency campaign, right? They wanted to wipe out anyone who was opposed to the military, anybody who was opposed to the government. And by 1980, that definition was really, really broad. Um, so families who maybe weren't even engaged in, in a student union, weren't engaged in the farm workers movement, weren't engaged in the guerrilla, but also plenty who were, right? Whose sons were no longer with the family because they joined the, the opposition, they joined the armed opposition. Um, those families would have to leave their houses because they knew they were under threat. And then they would live in these encampments in the forest um, in this mix of arm-carrying people and non-arm-carrying people, people who had to flee their homes and people who were trying to fight back with arms. Um, and Moranita brought food and clothing and medicine to those zones. Um, and then a third part of their work day to day, all right, they were working with the poor. What does that mean day to day? Another part of that work was rescue. So I talked to people when I was in El Salvador who said, I'm alive today because when the death squad came for me, Mora and Ita put me in the back of their jeep, covered me and my family with a tarp, told us to lay down very quietly. And they got us past 5, 10, 15 military checkpoints on this long road 
from the countryside where we were down to El Salvador, to San Salvador, where the big, beautiful, sprawling um, archdiocesan properties, right, the seminary and the cathedral, had been turned into these makeshift refugee centers, an early version of sanctuary, right? Um, where these, the grounds of these beautiful places had been turned into places where people fleeing the violence of the countryside could come. And they weren't recognized refugee centers, they weren't run by the Red Cross because it was an internal war, but, but they operated with a little bit more safety than your, your house out in the countryside. So more need to brought people in uh, to rescue in those ways into these makeshift refugee centers. So why were they killed? I think they were worth killing. I think it was worth it to the military government of El Salvador to kill these four women who were doing really singular work, who were doing work that was an affront to the regime. The, the regime wanted to kill anyone who could give the guerrillas any comfort. It was this counterinsurgency method that we had developed in Vietnam and that we taught to the Salvador military through um, a whole variety of war colleges that we run, School of the Americas, but others as well. Um, and they were keeping those people alive that, that the military wanted to see dead. Um, and they were, um, they were documenting it, particulars of crime, right? Someone can scream hysterically about, about a violation, but these nuns have it written down in chapter and verse and dated and signed and filed with an attorney. Um, they were bringing rescue to people who could be witnesses, right? The people who could name what happened to them. Um, and they were doing it while not being part of the guerrilla, right? They were doing it while not being combatants. They were doing it while still being nuns, which is subversive, which is dangerous, which is women bound neither to man nor money, right? Uh, they were doing it on, on behalf of a belief that everyone mattered. I mean, the ideology that was the, the movement in Nicaragua and in El Salvador was powerful enough. Um, but this far vaster idea, right, this far vaster ideology of Christianity, of this people of God, of this notion that the individual is holy because God is in the midst of the people, it's a really really crazy ideology that, that God is made present when people are gathered together, that the body of Christ is made real in the sharing of communion of people joined together for a common purpose. That's really dangerous, right? That is something that motivates people. Um, that is something that changes uh, a whole people's thinking. So the politics is, is big enough, but the politics when undergirded or, or shot through with a far deeper and older belief in uh, the sacredness of, of people, of human rights, is really dangerous. Um, so I think they were killed because they were threatening to this regime. They believed that everyone mattered, that everyone deserved and was born with certain fundamental rights, that as children of God they deserved not suffering, but joy. One of the young men Mora and Ita worked with in Chalatenango in 1980 Describe them to me as Salvadoran. Oh, they became Salvadoran. They adopted the love and terror of his country. They became part of the people they loved. So what does this mean for us? I think many of us feel frightened and lonely, lost maybe, in a country that, that seems newly unfamiliar. There's strength, both theological and spiritual, and actual strength in being together, in joining, in being with neighbors, in going to the meeting, in finding the group. Tyranny needs frightened and disorganized people. The threatening thing that the Marinals and so many others were doing in Nicaragua was gathering people together so that they weren't isolated in their fear, but rather they were united in possibility. To talk about migrants and immigrants, the terror of the war in El Salvador, and I was only really talking about the first year, right? It went on until 1992. Um, the terror of that war and similar campaigns in Honduras and in Guatemala left the countries in disarray, brutalized, 
and traumatized. You think about what happens to a single family with a single crime, right? A, a victim of gun violence in, in Boston and how that explodes in a family and how that one death reverberates down generations and out among cousins and distorts relationships of brothers and sisters. I spoke to a woman in El Salvador who had lost 23 members of her family in the Civil War. Um, so you think about the bomb going off in a family of one, one violent death, and, and this was a whole country experiencing those violent deaths. Um, so those migrant kids that we read about a couple of summers ago, coming up on the beast, uh, being put in ice boxes by Obama, uh, being turned away at the border, right? Um, they were part of a feedback loop, right? They were part of a long blowback uh, that began with this war 35 years ago, a generation and a half, maybe two generations in those kids' lives ago. Um, it began during these proxy wars in the 80s. The neighbors of yours and mine that the new president promises to round up, the refugees we say we can't afford to trust, they're these people. And those from dozens of other countries destabilized and made impossible by war. And by war and then by drugs. What happened in El Salvador is that people fled that war in the 80s and landed in the US in the mid 80s, right? They landed in South Central in the 80s and picked up uh, gang, you know, US, LA gang culture. And then when uh, Clinton signed the 1996 Immigration Reform Act that meant if you were an immigrant and you were ever convicted of a crime, you would be deported even if you had come as a two-year-old and grown up in LA, so much an American that you were a gang member, um, you would then be deported after serving your US criminal sentence. So we, we, it's like epidemiology, right? Like we spread LA 80s gang culture back to El Salvador and in a right vector, right? In a country with weak institutions, uh, traumatized by its own war, it blossomed. Um, and now has made the country very difficult to live in, particularly for young men who now come back up here, right? And we turn them back. Um, it's this long feedback loop. And it's drugs, a ton of it is our US drug habit, right? Um, Moore's work of arguing that no one is disposable still matters. Those gang member kids, those victims of gang recruitment in El Salvador today, um, those people from whatever country fleeing the horror of war are those people who Moore was working with in her day. And the work of Socorro Jurídico, this legal aid office that she worked for, that continues today in a successor called Tutela Legal, another human rights office. Um, the long legacy of the war is violence, is a, is a sort of uh, sickness of violence. And the, the lawyers at Tutela Legal and other human rights campaigners in El Salvador argue today that an accounting an acknowledgement, a peeling back of this festering wound that never healed is what is necessary to heal the violence that affects El Salvador today. And that's one of the things that Tutela Legal and other human rights organizations in El Salvador are trying to do now. In investigating Mora's life, in sitting many nights with all these stories, um, with all these interviews of Salvadorans, with all these you know, half redacted US government documents, I think about evil, and I think about otherness, and I think about the horror we can commit. When we label an enemy and we call them a threat, the oceans of blood, the mountains of bodies, the morgues full of mutilated bodies, that we paid for in the Cold War were created in the name of fighting communism. We do the same things today in the name of fighting terrorism. The human beings who slaughtered their neighbors in El Salvador and kidnapped nuns did so not because they were possessed by the devil, but because they understood them to be a threat. 
because the other, the danger, had been dehumanized to the point that it was necessary to protect yourself from the danger of this other, from the danger of this ideology that might hurt you, from the danger of human rights workers. But hear this too. These Salvadorans that I spent time interviewing, listening to, and kind of marveling over continue. This woman I mentioned who lost 23 members of her family in the Salvadoran Civil War was a young um, youth group member and logistics coordinator for the guerrillas in 1980. And now she runs a, um, a public health education campaign, you know, something like what you would I'm sure has ancillaries here in Boston, you know, a public health outreach to teenagers kind of organization um, that works around women's empowerment and, and uh, yeah, in a public health uh, campaigner sort of methods. She's named that organization in memory of the church women. So it's called the Foundation for the Capacity of Health, Mora, Ita, Dorothy, and Jean. Um, there are a number of Salvadorans in this country who fled during the war when they were going to be killed. Those who survived and made it here are now labor organizers with the National Day Labor Organizing Network. People organize day labor guys on the corner. Um, there was a big labor victory a couple of years ago in Seattle. The Seattle Port Authority Airport workers got a, a living wage. Um, the Salvadoran at the center of that labor campaign. You know, he was going to be killed in El Salvador. He came here in 1981 and became uh, a labor organizer in San Francisco and, and then in Seattle. Um, people involved, obviously, in Sanctuary today and in Sanctuary in the 80s, uh, but especially people involved in immigrant rights and labor movement and the fight for 15 right now. Many of them are Salvadorans who began as student organizers in the late 70s and kept going. And so when I was doing this research and trying to do the, the kind of follow-on part, the, the human rights law part of it, those people just kept going, right? They, they experienced awfulness. And, you know, I might have read some things that seemed dark, but that wasn't the half of it, right? Um, but they kept going year by year and meeting by meeting right? and coalition by coalition until last year they overturned this amnesty that was signed at the end of the Civil War uh, that many human rights critics think just protected the killers, right? They, you, need a, you, need a, you need repentance before you can have forgiveness, right? Uh, Cornell West talks about premature forgiveness. Uh, you can't have an amnesty if you haven't had an accounting. That thinking goes. Anyway, that took 30 years to overturn, right? But they worked on that and, and have worked on um, at least laying the groundwork so that you could bring human rights, international law, transitional justice cases. But I think more inspiring is when we were in El Salvador the last time, we stayed in this little community, one of the villages that Moranita, and I've spoken a lot about them, but that Moranita worked in, uh, it had to evacuate during the war because it was just too terrible to live there. So the people evacuated and went to refugee camps in Honduras. And then they came back during, towards the end of the war, and they planted a town. Different people from different places said, we're gonna live here. And, um, and they, the town is called San Antonio Los Ranchos, so St. Anthony, right? Um, but they have this festival every year that commemorates the church women, where they carry these big posters of the church women's faces, and, altars set up outside the church and songs and poetry and it's all um, it's very performative right uh, and nobody who lives there knew them because the people who knew them fled and then other people retook the land um, as a statement of you can't kill us all we're coming back we're going to build our women's committee here on this land and we're going to have our cooperative fields here on this land um, and so when I was there I was like that's so I don't quite like they didn't know who these women and there were so many Salvadorans who were killed why are you remembering these four but it was it was the patronal feast right to go back to the pre-Vatican II church to go back to the you know take the virgin out of the church and carry her around or San Gennaro or something it was the patronal feast of the village but instead of for St. Anthony it was for these four Americans who had loved them who had committed who had stayed who had chosen 
solidarity in a time of tyranny, who had chosen to become one with the people that they loved. post-Vatican II church is an extraordinary exodus of women and men from religious life, including uh, Mary Knoll. Uh, do you have any evidence of uh, Morris having extraordinary doubts or relationships that tempted her to uh, take that same route and maybe stay working in El Salvador, but not as a, as a Mary Knoll sister? Yeah, that's a really great question. I didn't find any evidence that she ever considered leaving she did fall in love in the mid-70s, and that was really destabilizing and confusing. She was, you know, with the better part of 20 years into vows of celibacy, and she wasn't a young woman anymore. Uh, she was probably in her mid-40s, and this swept her up. And, um, you know, the, the sisters were so extraordinarily close to each other, those little communities of women living together and praying together and analyzing and, talking, um, you know, the sisters I spoke to said, my God, we all fell in love, like, right? <laughs> and some of us left and, and married those people or some of us left and didn't marry those people um, and some of us stayed and kind of integrated that experience of falling in love into being more fully human and understanding more of what it is to be alive. And, it, it, and that's what Maura did. There's not, I don't believe she ever actually told the priest that she loved, that she loved him, in part because her friends were like, oh God, <laughs> um, because they weren't fans, actually. Um, but I don't think she, so anyway, I don't think she struggled with leaving, but she certainly struggled with the thing that led many people to leave. Um, and I know that also earlier than that, she struggled with seeing so many of her friends leave. And, you know, now, 30, 40 years later, it doesn't seem, like it doesn't seem controversial or tragic, right? Like we know so many ex-nuns. And so many people who were members of congregations are now part of associates programs and go on retreat with their old sisters. But at the time, one of Moore's friends described it as like watching 
watching your sister get a divorce and then your next sister and then your next sister and then your next sister. And so that was just, you know, that felt terrible at the time and confusing. Um, yeah. Anyone else? Well, thank you so very much and you might be...